Hello and welcome to a video building up on my previous top 9 list as we add trails into Reverie in the mix, which means we need to update this to a top 10. Fear not. I'm on the case. <laughs> the link to the top 9 is in the description. And a little warning, there will be massive spoilers up ahead. So in contrast to all my other videos, I will not hold back. And the real person behind this mask is just one of many things here. So let's get started. Trails into Rory is the 10th game in the Trails series. It's another transistor game, similar to Trails in the Sky the Third. And it uses a lot of the game's mechanics that game had exclusively till now. We have three storylines, which meet for the final of the game, which also means three groups of characters who are all together in the final act, and every now and again in the Rory corridors. The whole game has a way more complicated structure than any other Trails game before, and it works out well for the most part. The story begins a few months after the wedding of Olivier and Sherazade. The special support section, led by Lloyd Bennings, liberates Crossbell from EDF troops, who still occupied the city after the Great War, the one we had in Cold Sea 4, ended. Shortly afterwards, at the signing ceremony for Crossbell's independence, a copy of Rufus Alberera occupies the city. Again. And he and his EDF troops take control of the city. Again. Injuring Lloyd in the process. At this point, the game actually starts, and we get three story paths, which we can switch back and forth to until we reach a point that forces us to complete other paths before we can go on. Let me give you a short overview about the three storylines before they reach the final. I will name the path after its protagonist since that's the way the game does it. In every chapter, the game mixes up the cast from the group of characters surrounding the main character of the path, with the exception of C's path, since the amount of people he gathered is limited. But Wien gets almost everyone from old and new class 7, and Lloyd has his SSS buddies, the Liberal crew, and even a few old class 7 people who ended up stuck in Corspell. Let's start with Wien's path. And from a writing perspective, this one could have benefited most from a rewrite. Wien and his students from Thor's military academy are hired to search for Prince Olivier and his wife Sherazade, who are missing alongside their airship the Courageous 2. Before they get hired, they are tested in a brutal fight between them and Matthias Wander, supported by Claire, who also trapped the area. This is the first weakness of the script. Why would you hire students for this job? There needs to be a reason for that, and it was already there. Point out you can't trust the military, and therefore hire an alternative that proved to be reliable in the past. It would also have been a great opportunity to change the protagonist to Claire, and change the start of this arc a little. We had Rina as the lead for four games now, and switching it up would have been a smart move. Wouldn't even get in the way of the story. The first lead to the mission was provided by C and led to the capital of Heimdall. Here Wien's group is manipulated to follow certain clues that lead them right into foiling a coup d'etat. They unmask C at the end of this part and he gives them the lead to look for the missing couple in Nord. In Nord we foil a ploy around automated war machines from Erebonia and Calvart, which are rushed against each other to spark the flame of war anew. After that has been foiled. We sadly reach the weakest point of Reverie. There is a dangerous situation that feels awfully forced since it would have been prevented by the numerous strategic geniuses by ordering an obvious evacuation. There needed to be a more apt reason to trigger the events that led to the supernatural mumbo jumbo that follows. Mystical beasts appear to lend a hand and everything somehow works out. Also, every airship they had is now broken. Shortly thereafter, the group teleports to the south of Crossbell, since flying is in more ways than one not possible anymore. And here they liberate Michelin, where they find a copy of Wien, though cooler looking and with more personality than the original, and the Divine Knight that shouldn't exist. After getting past that, the path unites with the other two and we start the final. The second path is Lloyd's. After his defeat against the Supreme Leader Rufus, he is patched up by Wixia and they look into the new EDF occupation of Crossbell. 
This would be the moment to mention that Lloyd also could have been replaced as a protagonist. Since we already have seen his arc in Zero to Azure, give this path to Rixia. Focus a little more on her conflict with the mind-controlled Ilya and have a fresh perspective for the fight for Quaspel. Lloyd gets support from Lechter after a short reconnaissance mission almost ended with his capture and unites with a few more companions in Amorica. Here he gets sent to the old battlefield and finds out about Ilya being the black dancer who brainwashes the people in Crossbell for the supreme leader Rufus. After he gets rescued by Vasi and his squires, he is making his way to St. Ursula to move on from there to a military factory where the EDF war machines seem to come from. He has to work together with Z's group. Since the security terminals here and in Rosenberg Studios where C is, trying to make progress, are somehow connected and needed to be used simultaneously. After exploring the whole place, he finds Dr. Novartis, who let them fight a copy of McBurn. And afterwards, the factory is breaking apart. Rescued by Noel, the group unites with a group of police officers that fled Crossbell, and from here on, they try to reach mines, where they hope to save the CGF and combine forces. They reunite with Randolph and make their way to the Moon Tap. On the way they run into an EDF group, but get rescued by a group of bracers led by Estelle and Joshua. They also brought more of Crossbill's police as backup. After defeating Ilya in the Moon Temple, who is fleeing shortly afterwards, all of Lloyd's group is united, and more or less at the same time, the path unites with the other two. And we start the final. Last and maybe most interesting path is C. And behind the mask is the real Rufus. The supreme leader is just like me. Burn and Arius in Nord, an android copy. While Rufus is not a bad idea per se as a protagonist, I have mixed feelings here. After him backstabbing Lian, I seriously think of him as irredeemable and would have loved to see him getting the Wiseman treatment. If it was just for him being a former dictator and for his role with the Iron Bloods, this could work fine, but the murder pushed him over the edge. Rufus meets the two runaway assassins Nadia and Swin, who had the quest to carry a suitcase to a guy named C. Since that's the name Rufus is going with at that time, he gets the suitcase and in it is Lapis, a Rosenberg doll with a conscience, and sadly a surfcase of memory doors. They first do a Wien's group to Heimdall, leaving them do the work to foil the coup d'etat and take a airship to Korspel after leading Wien to Nord. In Korspel, they get the help of Wen and start to infiltrate the Rosenberg studio to get Lapis' memory back. As mentioned, they have to work with Lloyd's group since the security terminals were linked between here and the factory. At the end, they fight someone who seems to be a copy of the Emperor, someone from Nadia and Swin's past. The information leads them to Korspel Prison and we get the full backstory of Lapis. After we defeat the Emperor, the ranged zombie monster form. We get these informations from Iron Grimwood, which you remember as one of the rather ineffective main villains of Azure. Or you don't, because the guy got talked out of his year-long plan that even made him murder Lloyd's brother to succeed in two minutes by a speech of Lloyd. Yeah, that guy. For some reason, Lapis, as the administrator of Elysium, who is an AI that came into existence because of some spirit rain and orbital network crossover while the spirit brains were pumping due to the Great Twilight, contacted the imprisoned lawyer to learn more about humanity. It's not explained why she chose that guy. Elysium is able to predict the future due to calculating all possible scenarios. Lapis was removed from her administrator role and used her last access for a plan to get reinstalled as such by letting her doll self get delivered to Rufus. That's the gist of it. I don't want this video to be two hours long. While all of this happens, the group gets pulled into the recovery corridors from time to time, when AI tells them, due to the anomaly, they have been summoned, so they could train here to be strong enough to get their job done. Basically, this place works like Phantasma from Trails in the Sky 3, but with less hostility and more supply facilities. How this place came into existence is a mystery that's answered in the post-game. In the final, all groups unite, we get Ilya's carrier back on track and finish off the Supreme Leader Rufus using regular Rufus. We get a little sightseeing and Estelle can wrap up the game's fishing one by getting the final haul. After that we get a long cinematic where everyone who didn't show up till now can wave into the camera 
except Kevin and Reese, who just get named but not shown. That's a practical joke by Falcon by now. After that, we infiltrate a doomsday weapons tower that appeared next to Crossbell. So, just if you thought that Azure tree was weird, where we said, hold my beer. On the top floor, we meet the charismatic Ween, who is an Ismalga Ween hybrid. He took over Elysium, and after a fight where I can beat him up with Estelle and her 8 leaves, one big stick technique, a long tedious mech fight sequence follows. And since that's the first time we get these mech fights in this game, some people might struggle with the mechanics. And after that, we get yet another fight against now solo Ismalga, who we can again beat up with Estelle. After his defeat, he programs the Doomsday to auto target the next thing people hate most, which in the long run would destroy humanity. The crew can't stop this, and since the things heat up rather badly in the tower, they need to teleport out. Rufus secretly stays behind and uses his winning personality with a worldwide broadcast to make sure people hate him above everything else, and since he is still inside the doomsday device, that's the primary target now. He is saved last seconds by some of his companions, who make clear they don't like the self-sacrifice part of his plan. There is some epilogue and quite a bit post-game stuff which is mostly fight after fight, and I won't get into that too much. So how does the game fare compared to its predecessors? I had to think about that one. The writing is sloppy at quite a few occasions. If I have to listen to another person squeeze out a Oh Ween, I'm probably gonna be sick and the mech fights at the end did not up the overall quality. Neither did the ween to ween talk in that ween only party zone. The dramatic speeches about love, friendship and never give up get a bit too redundant and the enemy tropes could dial back a little for sure. On the other hand, almost every character seems to have been at least named and most also shown in the game. New players will get a very good crash course and can get from zeros to legends of heroes, and seasoned players will love all the references. We even get some character development, especially with some characters that four Cold Steel games couldn't get done. For example, Machias, who actually gets some nice moments and a good friend in Dudley, or Emma, who learns her mother was too stupid to ask for help before she reached the point of no return. The new characters are all rather good and especially Nadia steals every scene she's in. In the end I wanted to talk a bit about the difficulty. Your characters can all be complete juggernauts with all the equipment options. Quite a bit overpowered mechanics like United Fonts and the ludicrous amount of damage a caster can do with the base level skill of an element add to the mix. In comparison, they devalue the crafts quite a bit. Aside from Estelle who hit Smalga and break state for whooping 150,000 and over 200,000 when it comes to the end boss of the Rory corridors, the Ashcraft did most of the time less damage than a caster with a base cast, since many master quads give out crit hits to arts like candy. There were quite a few other things I noticed and the hard mode really felt like story mode. There are two more difficulty modes, but people who search for a challenge will not get much out of this. After thinking about this for a while, I think the good stuff outweighs the weaker parts by far, so the final rank for Rory is rank 2. I enjoyed most of the game, and I feel like after this transition away from Cold Steel towards the next storyline, we can follow the trails into the future. What do you think? Is Rory as good as I think? Is Rufus getting a second chance a good thing? Or did he cross the line of no return after backstabbing Lian? And did you also miss Annalise the Divine Blade of Cuteness? Leave a comment and let me find out.